there's nothing better than a good nap. Now Trump's head slowly dropped. His eyes closed. It jerked back upward. He adjusts himself. Then his head droops again. He straightens up, leaning back. His head drops for a third time. He shakes his shoulders, eyes closed still. His head drops. Finally, he pops his eyes open. Frank Runyon, pool reporter and New York courts reporter, Law 360, 1030 a.m., April 16th, 2024. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drain. John Keats, Ode to a Nightingale, May 1819. Trump is leaning back, and his eyes appear to be closed. His head is occasionally tilting. Isaac Arnsdorf, Washington Post reporter, 3.35 p.m., April 16, 2024. Fly ball to right. Winfield goes back to the wall. He hits his head on the wall, and it rolls off. It's rolling all the way back to second base. This is a terrible thing. Jerry Coleman, San Diego Padres baseball broadcast, circa 1977. They finished for the day and will resume tomorrow. Justice Mershon first admonishing Trump for gesturing and talking in the direction of a jury candidate. Your client was audibly uttering, he told Defendant Jay's attorneys. It was audible. He was gesturing and he was speaking in the direction of the juror. I will not have any jurors intimidated in the courtroom. I was surprised Trump didn't just reply, sorry, talking in my sleep. Trump then left to exploit a crime that happened at a Harlem bodega, possibly his first time in Harlem in his goddamned life. And it looks like despite all the doomsayers, me included, they will start the Trump election interference trial next Monday, 9.30 a.m. opening statements. That is what Justice Mershon told the court just before shutting down yesterday, after he had seated seven of the 18 jurors required, again validating the veteran legal reporters who say it is surprisingly easy, especially in New York, to find enough people who don't know anything about anything to fill up a jury. I had forgotten my two days in the New York jury pool room here 11 years ago when I deliberately sat near the guy in charge so I could hear the kinds of questions he had to deal with. And after about an hour, I was terrified for the future of humanity. I mean, the future of humanity for the remainder of that week. Also for the future of this poor man's psyche. And I asked if I could go get him coffee or heroin or something. There is already a four-person, juror B-400, lives in West Harlem, but originally was from Ireland, was a waiter, now in sales, some college, his spouse is in school, they have no children, he's outdoorsy in his spare time, he reads the New York Times and the Daily Mail, gets the rest of his news from MSNBC and Fox. Repeating what I said before, it is surprisingly easy to find enough people in New York who don't know anything about anything to fill up a jury. Or to be the defendant. That is Trump's latest claim. He knows nothing. Billionaire businessman, greatest mind of this or any other generation. But when it comes to paying off Stormy Daniels to bury her story, to illegally keep bad facts about himself away from the eyes of the electorate weeks before the election, and then turning the thing into a clear crime by trying to write it off as a business expense, he knows nothing. He doesn't know the accountant. He doesn't know the lawyer. He doesn't know the law. He didn't know anything about the document. He didn't know anything about the deduction. He just signed whatever they put in front of him because the billionaire businessman knows nothing about his own business. I was paying a lawyer and marked it down as a legal expense. Some accountant, I didn't know, marked it down as a legal expense. That's exactly what it was. And you've been indicted over that? No wonder he keeps falling asleep in the courtroom. This business stuff. It's all so boring to him. And honestly, your Trump, on Monday, they literally catch you napping. How do you possibly go in there on Tuesday and get caught napping at least twice more? One video or one rapid shutter sequence of still pictures of Trump's head slowly dropped, 
His eyes closed. It jerked back upward. He adjusts himself. Then his head droops again. One video of that, or a couple of good pictures, and we don't have to watch the rest of this trial to see how it turns out. He would be done. The New Republic asked the question before yesterday's Marjorie Taylor Greene debacle and before Tom Cotton suggested Americans protesting about the war in the Middle East should be run over and killed by other Americans who are angry about traffic. But it doesn't change much, and it certainly doesn't require them to change the picture under the startling question in their headline. The picture is a rare one of Congresswoman Greene with her mouth shut. And the New Republic's question is, quote, Russia is buying politicians in Europe. Is it happening here, too? The message from the magazine is clear, looking at you, Marge. The possibility of that, never mind influencers and conspiracies, it boils down to the Eric Idle Ruttles satirical song, All You Need Is Cash, the possibility of that momentarily. First... What Cotton and Green have now done. Senator Tom Cotton, who last reminded America that he may be our worst senator, even worse than Marsha Blackburn or Grassley or Cinema, reminded us of that when the New York Times let him write an op-ed saying Trump should use the military to disperse peaceful civilian protesters. He has now softened his stance on that. Now he wants vigilantes to use their cars to disperse peaceful civilian protesters. At 9 p.m. Eastern, Monday night, Cotton, again, a sitting U.S. senator, a double Harvard graduate, back when one did not try to deny that part of one's educational resume, another military veteran who may not really believe he was ever discharged and may not really accept that he is no longer paid to kill other human beings. Tom Cotton posted... I encourage people who get stuck behind the pro-Hamas mobs blocking traffic. Take matters into your own hands. It's time to put an end to this nonsense. The implication was unmistakable. Run them over with your car. Shoot them. Whatever. Why does he care? He's stochastically getting you to kill them for him. Six minutes later... Tom Cotton decided better of that tweet, and instead of deleting it or discouraging people from, you know, political assassination of their neighbors or road rage, he edited the post to read, I encourage people who get stuck behind the pro-Hamas mobs blocking traffic, here comes the edit, take matters into your own hands to get them out of the way. It's time to put an end to this nonsense, unquote. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. This is nothing new. Ron DeSantis passed a law calling a protest by three or more people in Florida a riot and telling Florida drivers if they threatened or felt threatened by a riot on a road, they can drive their cars into the rioters. When George Wallace ran as a third-party presidential candidate in 1968, he responded to protesters lying down in front of President Johnson's limo by saying that if they tried that in front of his presidential limousine, it'd be the last limo they ever lay down in front of. But Cotton, as the the have-the-troops-shoot-the-civilians op-ed showed, clearly fetishizes killing Americans, as many as possible. And the Russia hook is... He's loudly pro-Ukraine, yet under the surface he has repeatedly refused to condemn Trump's repeated praising of Putin. He wouldn't criticize Trump saying that he would not defend NATO from Russia and that he'd tell Putin to do whatever the hell he wanted. And Business Insider quoted FEC records showing that Cotton got more than $40,000 in, quote, contributions from a donor profiting off Russia's war on Ukraine. But still, that's just because he's an asshole, right? Maybe some PTSD and fascism mixed in and too much time at Harvard. There couldn't be cash considerations. Ah, but then there's Marjorie Bitter Green. Hell of a week she's having. Tweets, quote, it's anti-Semitic to make Israeli aid contingent on funding Ukrainian Nazis. Then moves to fire another Speaker of the House because he's on the verge of maybe getting Ukrainian aid passed. And because the condition of the House of Representatives had just been upgraded from chaotic to spasmodic and Russia needs it to be chaotic again. That was preface to her face plant during yet another hearing featuring her arch nemesis, 
No, 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 no. Not reality. Her other arch nemesis, Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas. Blake and Riley, you're familiar with her, right? Congressman, our our break. Are you familiar with Lake and Riley? Uh, uh, I am uh, familiar with the case. You should have deported her so that she could be alive today. Her parents would have appreciated that. (sighs) Yeah, okay. Hun, Lake and Riley was the murder victim, not the perpetrator. Y'all should emulate your boy Trump and take a nap from time to time. How about 24 hours a day? Now, you could argue that if Russia really were paying U.S. politicians to advocate for them and try to destroy this country from within, they'd be able to get smarter ones than Marjorie effing Green. But maybe not. Last month, a couple of dozen European politicians, including some members of the European Parliament, were arrested in Poland and the Czech Republic for taking cash from Russian oligarchs to contribute anti-Ukraine stories mostly to a website called Voice of Europe. Last month, Russia was caught paying off local politicians in Cyprus and Germany and Italy to introduce legislation actually written by Russian intelligence and also to write articles in local newspapers and use their own names when they did so. This is why Marjorie Greene's stupidity is not a bug but a feature. As the New Republic notes, one of the paid-off Europeans was really offended that the article the Russians wanted him to pass off as his own, under his own byline, was really poorly written, that he had a reputation, that, quote, I am not a robot. He was taking international bribes from a terrorist state, and he was worried about how the article would affect his literary standing. Unclear if he got the cash or the crypto, but he got something, and the article, lousy or not, got printed under his name. It it can't happen here? It uh, it can happen. It it can't happen here? Doc is here? Doc isn't here. Doc, 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 Doc is here. It can't happen here. I'll let Alex Finley of the New Republic pick this up at this point, quoting him. It is naive to think the same pattern does not exist in the United States, given the ample evidence of coordinated pro Russian talking points from several Republican politicians. Just this week, Marjorie Taylor Greene spoke to Steve Bannon about Ukraine's persecution of Christians which is a Kremlin talking point aimed at boosting the pro-Moscow wing of Ukraine's Orthodox Church. The U.S. should be spending money on the border with Mexico, not on Ukraine aid. That's a Kremlin talking point. Russia invaded Ukraine to defend itself against an expanding NATO. That's a Kremlin talking point. Call for a ceasefire and give Russia Crimea and eastern Ukraine. That's a Kremlin talking point. As the director of national intelligence wrote in 2021, Russian intelligence operatives and their proxies sought to use prominent U.S. persons and media conduits to launder their narratives to U.S. officials and audiences. These Russian proxies met with and provided materials to Trump administration linked U.S. persons to advocate for formal investigations, hired a U.S. firm to petition U.S. officials and attempted to make contact with several senior U.S. officials. They also made contact with established U.S. media figures, unquote, huh? established U.S. media figures spewing Russian talking points, probably for money, probably a lot less money than you'd think, too. So somebody in media who's notoriously personally cheap, I do not have a guess. Any established U.S. media figures hard up for cash or paranoid about cash after losing, say, a $20 $20 million a year TV anchoring contract? I mean, besides which, what do you think a Marjorie Taylor Greene would cost? I mean, look at the workmanship. It's not as if Russia's influence here, both to undermine efforts to stop their test war in Ukraine and to simply F with us, is not being recognized. Chairman Mike Turner of the House Intel Committee went on CNN and said, quote, we see directly coming from Russia attempts to mask communications that are anti-Ukraine and pro-Russia messages, some of which we even hear being uttered on the House floor. 
Days earlier, it had been Chairman Michael McCall of House Foreign Affairs. He told Puck News, I think Russian propaganda has made its way into the United States, unfortunately, and it's infected a good chunk of my party's base. Nothing spreads political disinformation infection faster than money. By the way, I know you know, but let me emphasize this. The House is in Republican hands. Those two chairmen admitting we are being informationally invaded by Russia, Turner and McCall, they are Republicans. The craziest part of the New Republic's theory of corruption for cash, the one that literally has Marjorie Taylor Greene's face on it, on the article, and only incidental references to Trump media being kept financially afloat by Russian banks. The craziest part is that Green's latest attack on the American establishment, seemingly on the reinvigorated anti-Russian pro-Ukrainian push in the House, it's against Speaker Mike Johnson. But last October, Newsweek reported that in 2018, Mike Johnson received tens of thousands of dollars in campaign contributions from the Texas-based American Ethane Company. Made prominent and wealthy by good old Texas know-how. Led by an 88% owned by three good old Texans named Andre Konatbyev, Konstantin Nikolaev, and Mikhail Yuryev. The Speaker's office says it returned the money as soon as it found out that American Ethane was not owned by three guys named Curly, Tex, and Clayton. Makes you wonder if Green is attacking Johnson because he returned the Ethane money. Or perhaps because he hasn't earned it yet. CBS News poll, by the way, where do you get your information from about Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Republicans? Which sources do you trust, Republicans? Multiple sources here. So it doesn't add up to 100. It's more than 100. State Department, 27% say yes, among others. Journalists in the war zone, 33%. Conservative media, 56%. The Pentagon, 60%. Topping the list, though, 79% of Republicans get their information about Ukraine from Trump. And this is not part of that CBS poll, but it underscores that the process of healing the Republicans' amazing stupidity and gullibility and ability to monetize lies that kill people and kill democracy, the process of curing this country is far more than even horrifying poll numbers like that. Republicans believe Trump because the world is complex, and they are not. Leaving it to him is way easier than trying to figure it out for themselves with brains unequipped to do so. And if you ask, but whatever he's talking about, he changes his stories every day, his viewpoints, his claims of what he said previously and what he meant when he said it. He changes these things endlessly. Left is right and up is down. Well, that's even better for these Republicans. Even if he's lying? Especially if he's lying. Listen to William Wolf, former Trump Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense and appointee at state. It's like Trump favoring an abortion ban, Wolf says. Of course he's lying about it. Only he's lying about lying about it. And that makes it not lying. That makes it cloaking. I actually think there's wisdom in cloaking some of your power levels and maybe some of the things that you're trying to do. And then once you secure power and you have it, you govern in a more extreme position. He's not lying. He's cloaking. A cloaking device like Star Trek or an invisibility cloak like good old Harry Potter. You don't call it lying. You call it cloaking. It's a new way of lying. And it's a good thing because Trump says so. Also of interest here, I don't know when I stopped believing that the Supreme Court actually ruled on legal issues. Rather than that, it existed solely to make sure that some politically inconvenient laws or parts of the Constitution got crushed for the benefit of the Republicans and the rich people. But I know... I was already an adult when I figured it out. Right now, I am so far from that naivete that I question whether or not I believe that the six conservatives are even from this country or that they have more of a legal education than I do, which was one undergraduate college class, mostly about communications law. 
in the January 6th related case now before them, Justice Alito asks how the insurrection and attempted overthrow of an election and the real president-elect, how is that different from people heckling the Supreme Court? And the attorney has the restraint to not say, because none of you assholes or your security died at the hands of that mob, that mob of people that you think heckled you, you moron. That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. ahead of us on this edition of Countdown. Late last month, we passed the quarter century anniversary of one of the most joyful moments of my career. And I have been thinking of it off and on ever since March 1999. Tom Hanks assaults me at the Oscars with the help of two Hollywood newcomers named Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. The bastards broke the cummerbund on my tuxedo. Ahead in things I promise not to tell. First, still more new idiots to talk about the daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's non-cummerbund breaking worst persons in the world. The bronze, worse, Major League Baseball. And this gives me a moment to mention that apparently we're having another baseball rapture. The next to last living member of the world champion 1955 Brooklyn Dodgers, Carl Erskine, died yesterday, leaving only Sandy Koufax. And Hall of Fame manager Whitey Herzog of the Royals and the Cardinals died. Ken Holtzman the other day. Fritz Peterson last week. I mentioned him at length yesterday. Jerry Grody, Bud Harrelson, Jim McAndrew of the 69 Mets, Pat Zachary and Don Gullett of the 76 champion Reds, Ed Ott, 14 ex-major league players, just since the start of spring training. On a happier note, or at least a sillier one, remember this year's big baseball controversy? I mean, the one before the Shohei Otani's interpreter made $325 million worth of bets and stole $16 million bucks from Otani scandal? Remember the uniform scandal? Where the new, better wicking, lighter feeling, redesigned uniforms turned out to be delivered late, like months late? and they wrinkled in the rain, and they had tiny lettering on them, and they have pants and shirts in which the colors don't match, not even gray and gray. And they have the pants that are more see-through than pants have been previously. That scandal, it's back. The Seattle Mariners wore their City Connect uniforms. It's a merchandising thing. Everything in baseball today is a merchandising thing. And we are still awaiting a full explanation from the Seattle Times of its cryptic report that the pants of Seattle pitcher Bryce Miller did not fit correctly. And so he instead wore the City Connect uniform pants of a team bat boy. The only update on this so far, Miller apparently complained that the bat boy's pants kept riding up on him, which makes you wonder whether his pants were so short that they were actually designed for somebody else's son further details as they become available. Speaking of a little short, the runner-up worser Mike Johnson. I know the Democrats may save him, and anybody Marjorie Taylor Greene hates is a little less schmucky than she is, and certainly, as noted earlier, he's less Russian than the others, but still, what a weasel. That stunt last week in which he asked Trump for permission to go worship him at Mar-a-Lago and do a joint news conference about election integrity and then introduce a performance art bill about demanding voter ID for all voters, which they already have. Before he showed the bill to anybody else in the House, according to NBC News, Johnson showed it to D.C. Drano. D.C. Drano is one of those conservative morons with a shtick on Twitter X. His real name is Brogan O'Crapshack or whatever it is. 
showed it to Brogan O'Crapshack first to get him to use his influence ray to drum up support online, which of course would then get back to Trump how much Johnson's idea would help Trump. But it wasn't just DC Drano, and I can't tell if he's trying to be clever by spelling it D-R-A-I-N-O when the product itself is spelled D-R-A-N-O, or he's just too stupid to spell it correctly. In any event, Johnson also shared the bill with libs of TikTok and End Wokeness and Chrissy Clark, who apparently could not think of a clever name. But he did not share it with Cat Turd. Poor Cat Turd. Though Johnson did eventually share it with Isabella DeLuca, who is not just an influencer, she's also a big, big deal in Moron World because she's a January 6th defendant. Speaking of which, our winners, the conservative members of the Supreme Religious Court. And yesterday they heard oral arguments in a case that would invalidate the use of the obstruction of an official proceedings law under which hundreds of January 6th defendants have been convicted, some of whom that was the only charge against them. So the case is basically asking John Roberts and Sam Alito and Clarence Thomas and three Trump appointees whether or not they want to free several dozen Trump thugs. Ellie Mistal from The Nation says Justice Neil Gorsuch made an analogy between the January 6th rioters attacking the U.S. Capitol, between that and the day that Congressman Jamal Bowman set off a fire alarm by opening a locked door at the Capitol. Justice Alito asked how this was any different from people heckling the Supreme Court. Oh no! He was broken in half by a heckle! And Justice Thomas, who simply put his goddamned lucky his wife has not been in prison for the last three years over January 6th, actually maybe the last 30 years, Justice Thomas insisted that legally January 6th is no different than any other attempt to disrupt official proceedings. Why, yes, Clarence, I agree with you. You are right. It is no different than any other attempt to disrupt the peaceful transfer of power instigated and organized and promoted by a lame duck president who wanted to stay in office even though he lost and who probably wanted to jail or harm the actual president-elect. I just hope that all of these arguments these fascists are using while finding excuses to make heroes out of traitors, that they will remember them if the day comes that some large crowd, probably made up of conservatives who think the justices are not conservative enough, when a large crowd of conservatives storms the court the way Trump's insurrectionists so benignly pulled the fire alarm at the Capitol on January 6th. I just hope they remember all their own arguments while they are fleeing. Gorsuch, Thomas, Kavanaugh, Barrett, Alito, Roberts. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. Two days. Worst persons in the world. Just 25 years ago, Things I Promised Not to Tell takes you back in time, like things I already experienced in my career could somehow be ahead in time, to March 1999, with a little detour first. They were everywhere. Photos and video of what certainly looked from a distance like actor Tom Hanks and his wife Rita Wilson yelling at, maybe even berating, an unidentified random staffer on the red carpet at the 2023 Cannes Film Festival in France while promoting his new movie, Asteroid City. At various intervals, Hanks seems to have a fist clenched, then seems to be jabbing his forefinger at the man. Throughout, he appeared to wear a look of disbelief verging on anger. European newspapers were filled for two days with stories about Tom Hanks yells at Khan and Tom Hanks yells at Staffer and Tom Hanks scolds Khan Staffer, etc., etc., etc. And then his wife Rita spoke up. Then the staffer, Vincent Chapelain, spoke up. Then the sound on the video spoke up louder than either of them. Tom Hanks wasn't scolding anybody, but he was yelling because he could not hear himself 
or this Vincent Champollain or anything else because the crowd around the red carpet was too loud. The clenched hand, Tom Hanks clenched it while he was yelling, I can't hear you, everybody's screaming. The jabbing forefinger, it went with, where are we supposed to go? Are we supposed to go back to the start of the red carpet? Just just point at where you want us to go. And the scolding of the random staffer, Vincent Chapelain is the manager of the red carpet at Cannes, has been for 10 years. The only thing he was taking offense at was people presuming he was just security rather than management. These are the French. Con, you hear me now? This is an unusual story to include here, and I've gone into unusual detail about it, because the moment I saw this story from Con, I didn't have mere deja vu. I had a full flashback, a full out-of-body experience. Time travel. I was propelled back to March 21st, 1999, where a similar overhead view of Tom Hanks on a red carpet without any audio, without any context, would have presented you a picture of first Tom Hanks and then Tom Hanks with the assistance of Ben Affleck and Matt Damon assaulting a guy, literally pulling him over the hedges that served as the security boundary, damaging the guy's clothing, and then basically throwing him back over the hedges. And all this took place on a red carpet at the Oscars. The guy was me. In 1999, I had just started what began as a pretty good gig. Fox Sports had launched its own version of ESPN and its own version of SportsCenter, and it had thrown way too much money at me, and it bought me out of my contract at MSNBC, where I was desperately unhappy doing the Clinton Lewinsky story every hour on the hour. And they got me to move back to Los Angeles and anchor their version of SportsCenter and all the Fox baseball coverage, too, including the World Series and the All-Star Game. And it launched a five-year plan to give itself enough credibility to compete with ESPN. And I was just there to enjoy the sun, collect the huge paycheck, and publicize the thing as often as possible while they slowly built it up for the year 2004. As the executive who signed me said after we held an introductory press conference and press phone call with about 200 reporters, you earned about a year of your salary just doing that call. So when one of the editors of the Los Angeles Times called somebody she knew in the PR department at Fox and said, I have a crazy idea. What is Keith Olbermann doing on Oscars night? The Fox people listened. The next thing I knew, I had that night off. I was in a tux I was standing amid a sea of photographers at the first turn of the red carpet at the Oscars, gathering quotes from startled celebrities who expected to see only photogs right there and not somebody asking questions, certainly not me asking questions. I was a little startled, too. The editor in a pre-Oscars phone call explained that this was the 71st edition of the Oscars and the Times had covered the first 70. Then they had pretty much gotten it down to a science around the year 1932 and they really hadn't changed much since then. Except the photos are in color now, she mentioned. She asked if I wanted to hear what would be in the Times the day after the Oscars. She said, I can recite the main story right now. I just have to fill in the names of the winners. And then there's the fashion review and how many daring and outlandish and classic outfits there were. Then I'll have the TV critic complaining about how bad the host was. And I'll have the TV business guy explaining why the ratings were so low. Then we'll have the big poll quotes from the actors that will read exactly like the big poll quotes from 1989 or 1979. And we'll have the predictive piece on which award wins will actually help movies at the box office. And then we'll have the predictive piece on which award snubs will actually hurt movies at the box office. What we need is anything else. Can you think of anything else? Can you think of anything you haven't read in our paper about the Oscars? I thought for a second. I said, what about this idea that they're now going to televise the red carpet live for half an hour before the Oscars, you're going to have like a Oscars pregame show. I heard somebody say, you know, maybe they could do that all day. I mean, what if I asked everybody like, uh, like whoever will stop to talk to me? I mean, what if I asked them, would they think it'd be a good idea to make the Oscars an all day kind of thing? Like, like Super Bowl Sunday, Oscar Sunday, Oscar Bowl. 
live starting at dawn on ABC. I mean, I could basically write you the lead paragraph now. Thanks for attending Oscar Bowl one. Please ask your limo driver to tune into the postgame show with uh, Vin Scully, Uma Thurman and uh, Angeline. No, not, not Angeline. Edie Williams. Arrive home safely. The editor laughed, had me repeat it, and wrote it down. It was the lead of my story. So on the night of March 21st, 1999, Oscars night, there I was, officially a sports reporter and ex-news reporter and ex-local L.A. sportscaster on top of everything else. There I was at the first corner of the red carpet in front of the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, standing where one of the 80 or so L.A. Times photographers should have been. And I never found out what he thought of this idea. And I was introducing myself to actors and actresses and producers and other people who had no idea who I was. Helen Hunt was particularly confused and explaining why I was there to actors and actresses who knew exactly who I was. Kevin Costner was particularly confused. Some of them gave thoughtful answers to my question about an all-day Oscars. Helen Hunt actually thought about it and said something interesting. Costner said he would never watch anything like that instead of, say, college basketball. He recommended against doing it, and he said, we already know too much about the things we already know about. And I knew exactly what he meant. What a great quote. We shook hands, and Costner took a deep breath, and he moved towards the gauntlet of the next 500 reporters down the red carpet and said, wish me luck, Keith. Within two minutes, I then saw Costner walking back towards me. Can you do me a favor? I mean, I'm sorry, but can you not run that quote? I've never retracted a quote in my life. But that'll make me sound like Yogi Berra. I said it didn't make him sound like Yogi Berra. It was perfect, and everybody would know exactly what he meant. But of course, if that's what he wanted, I'd, I'd forget it. I wouldn't use the quote. Until now. Anyway, I had enough color and quotes, and technically my article was going to be labeled Arrivals, so it was done already as night began to fall, and I had one particular piece of gold handed to me when the fabled actress who had done the cameo in Titanic the year before arrived on the red carpet. The photographer standing on one side of me said, look, it's Martha Stewart. No, not Martha Stewart. I mean, uh, Gloria Swanson. Uh, no, you know who I mean. Uh, 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 Gloria Stewart. It was good that I had enough material, and I thought that was probably going to be my second paragraph because the editor had given me a deadline, like, I don't know, 6.30, 7 p.m., where I had to be back in the Times offices, which were a quick walk, a block or two away, and I had to start writing because they wanted to put my piece on the page with all the early photos from the red carpet and the start of the awards, and they needed my piece finished ASAP. But I lingered a few minutes longer than I was supposed to because there was only one actor I had really hoped I was going to get to meet. Tom Hanks. Finally, Keith comes back to Tom Hanks. Didn't see him. Everybody's already inside. I must have missed him. Or maybe he's not coming, even though he has a nominated film. And I'm about to leave. Literally, I'm double-checking my notes and my quotes when I heard some of the photogs shout, Tom! Tom! And there, finally, he was in a tux and a beard, and he gave them that half-mile actor stare and pleasant smile, and without being asked, he did a slow pan from side to side so each cameraman could get him in profile and in full face, and then he stopped, and his eyes widened comically, and he said, Keith Alberman, what are you doing here? Did you get fired again? That even got a laugh from the photographers. He then devolved into shtick. Come in with me. You can have Rita's ticket. Better than that. Why don't you go in with Rita? I'll go watch UCLA play. Rita Wilson smiled, waved, and while looking at her husband, she pointed to her own head and made that crazy gesture. And on and on and on it went. I asked Tom Hanks my questions. He gave me some good answers, he gave me a very nice double-handed handshake, and he moved on. And he was one or two people down the gauntlet of the red carpet when I thought, dummy, Tom Hanks is right there. He's a fan. You're a fan. You have a camera with you. You have a mother. Get a picture with him for mom. So I beckoned. So you'll go in with me? Hot dog. 
I explained what I actually wanted, and I handed my little disposable cardboard camera, remember those, to the nearest reporter I knew, Lara Spencer from Channel 7 in New York, more recently of Good Morning America. And I leaned back over the hedges, which in those innocent pre-9-11 days were the only things actually keeping the famous safe from us, the we merely cover the famous. Lara took a couple of shots. In them, it would prove my head is about four times as big as Tom's, and we both look like mutants, straining mutants. Wait, this won't work, Tom Hanks finally said. And with that, he grabbed me and started to pull me over the shrubbery. I was unprepared for this. I started to teeter. At this exact moment, I heard coming from the carpet behind me two guys chanting, Keith, Keith. Hanks turned around and said, Hello, boys. Look, it's Keith Olbermann. Can you believe this? Finally, a reason to actually show up to this dumb thing. Can we take him in with us? Have you guys got an extra ticket? Here, help me pull him over the hedge. The two guys were Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. Somewhere in this process... And Affleck and Damon were really young then. They really could pull. One of these three men broke my cummerbund. I swear. Suddenly, I was on the red carpet with them and with a loose cummerbund. Affleck struck a wrestling pose and made a grimace, a fake grimace. Lara Spencer shouted, that's a perfect shot, at which point I heard a sound effect, but in real life, nearly identical to the one that signaled the arrival of the reporters. Throughout the movie, the right stuff, like a thousand mosquitoes moving in unison. Every photographer there panned over to us because even those who did not know who I was or what Tom Hanks, Matt Damon, and Ben Affleck were doing to me did notice security rushing to this scene. It's all right, fellas, Hanks shouted. He fell. They helped me back over the hedge. Affleck asked me about the Red Sox chances in the season ahead. Hanks slapped me on the back. I barely managed to shout, enjoy the show, boys. And Damon turned and said, well, we just did. And they were gone. Any image of this scene, taken without sound and without context, would have been greeted perhaps as the stuff from Khan was about Tom Hanks. It would have shown three of Hollywood's top actors appearing to attack or maybe trying to subdue some guy who looked vaguely like some sports or news guy or something and the tux didn't fit well, it must have been a rental. It might have been a perimeter breach. I mean, look at the damage to the hedge, to say nothing of the guy's cummerbund. So when the story of Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson yelling at the guy on the red carpet at Con broke, all I could think of was, here we go again. As a postscript, I should note that I have seen Tom Hanks several times since then, and Hanks always mentions the cummerbund. Affleck once portrayed me on Saturday Night Live, and I went up to his studio, which was also the Football Night in America studio, to say hello at his rehearsal and offer him any tips he needed. And the next thing I knew, that was in the New York Post. Oberman crashes studio. And the photo of the four of us? Well, I clearly had enough stuff for my arrivals piece in the L.A. Times, so I jogged back to their offices a little late now and found the editor, and she asked me if the story would work, and I said, yes, I have enough, and then I sheepishly said, listen, there was a thing with me and, and Hanks and Affleck and Damon, and I, I, can I mention it in the piece maybe at the end? And again, her eyes widened as I explained what happened, and in great excitement, she asked, did anybody get a picture of this? And I said, well, yeah, I thought about a um, um, hundred real photographers got a picture of it. But but I was certain that my friend Lara from New York had gotten it on my disposable, which is when the editor grabbed the camera from my hand and left without a word, running down the hallway. And the next thing I saw of my camera or what was in it was the next morning when the front page of the LA Times Oscar section had four beautiful color pictures on it. One of Gwyneth Paltrow, Judy Dench, James Coburn, and Roberto Benigni. One of Ilya Kazan. It was the Ilya Kazan speech year. One of Kate Blanchett's dress as seen from behind. So it was a picture of Kate Blanchett's but and largest of all the pictures, me and the boys with the caption, the arrivals, 
Fox Sports News anchor Keith Olbermann is mugged by Tom Hanks, left Ben Affleck and Matt Damon on the red carpet, and lives to write about it. Page F2. I still have it framed on my wall. But just to be clear, Tom Hanks didn't actually mug me. I've done all the damage I can do here. Thank you for listening. Countdown musical directors Brian Ray and John Philip Chanel arranged, produced, and performed most of our music. Mr. Ray was on guitars, bass, and drums, and Mr. Chanel handled orchestration and keyboards, and it was produced by TKO Brothers. I saw Tom Hanks about two years after the incident at the Oscars. Having lunch, in he walked, and on the way out, he came by a side door and leaned in the window and talked to me and my friend Hank, appropriately enough. Lovely guy, Tom Hanks. Other music, including some of the Beethoven compositions, arranged and performed by the group No Horns Allowed. The sports music is the Olderman theme from ESPN2. It was written by Mitch Warren Davis and appears courtesy of ESPN Inc. Our pithy and satirical musical comments are by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Our announcer today was my friend, the actor Jonathan Banks. Everything else was pretty much my fault. So that's Countdown for this, the 203rd day until the 2024 presidential election, the 1,198th day since Defendant J. Trump's... first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States, used the 14th Amendment and the not regularly given elector objection provided by the Supreme Court, used the Insurrection Act, used the justice system, used the mental health system to stop him from doing it again while we still can. The next scheduled countdown is tomorrow. Bulletins as the news warrants. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. And, uh, the last one? Oh, that's right. Good luck.